G'day and welcome back to RC Model Reviews. Today I'm talking antennas and most particularly antenna theory because there are so many different types of antennas you've got. That's our skew planar wheel, we've all seen those. There's your new Pagoda antenna which is supposed to, you know, which actually does the job even better. We've got patch antennas, you know, well everyone's seen a patch antenna, these aren't very good, they are on my ones. You've got things like loaded antennas, this is a loaded antenna, see it's got a little coil in there. So. Um, they've obviously made that antenna shorter than it needs to be by putting a coil in it. There might even be a loading coil in here, I don't know. So there are all sorts of different ways to make antennas and they all basically do one job. They turn magnetic waves into electrical energy and I'm going to show you how they do that. Let's go over to the whiteboard and have a look at some theory. And welcome to the whiteboard. Here we are. Now look, this is a meter. The old meters had needles, they move backwards and forwards. We don't have those anymore. We've got LCD displays, so it's a little bit harder to show this with an LCD display, but I will do it. I'll do it just for you. And here are the leads from a meter. They go across and they connect up to a piece of wire. And here I have a magnet. This can be any old magnet. It can be a, you know, a, a neodymium magnet. It can even be an electromagnet. And what happens is these green lines here are what we call lines of flux, magnetic lines of force. And every magnet has them and they come out and they actually extend out into infinity. They get very weak of course, but in theory they go on to infinity. And if you had something sensitive enough, you could detect every magnet in the universe, but we don't have anything that sensitive. Uh, but anyway, here, here's a magnet, here's a magnetic field. And if we do something like this and have a magnet sitting by a wire, absolutely nothing happens. Nothing happens at all because this wire is an antenna, but it won't pick up a permanent magnet field. Um, antennas only work with a fluctuating magnetic field. And what happens is if we move this magnet, this magnet is moved up and down, left and right, whatever, then these lines of flux will actually pass through the wire. As you can see, if I move the magnet closer, then this line of flux will cross that wire. And if I move it down, then this line of flux will cross the wire. So when magnetic fly lines of flux intersect a conductor, a piece of wire, then you get a current induced in this circuit. So the current will flow through the circuit. Depending on which way the magnet is arranged, the current will flow this way or it could flow that way. And this is actually how alternators work, how generators alternate, is where we have a spinning shaft and electricity comes out. What happens is inside the alternator, we've got some magnets and some coils. And when the magnetic fields intersect with the coils, electricity is produced. And so that's the same theory as an antenna. And this actually brings up something interesting, completely un, well, not related to RC, but you can get um, wireless phone charges now, you know, um, you just put your phone on a pad and it charges if you've got the right phone and you've got the little wireless charger. How does that work? Well, it's the same thing. You've got a magnetic field, a fluctuating magnetic field in the little pad and you've got an, a coil of wire in your phone and the changing magnetic field induces a current in the coil which then charges your battery. You don't need wires, it's, it's a wireless electricity transmission and that's all that radio is. It's a wireless transmission of electricity. And there's all sorts of potential uses for this. But the one we use most often is communications and control. Radio control, for example, in this case. So that's how this works. Let's go, let's go over to the whiteboard now. Oh, sorry, I'm not the whiteboard. What am I thinking? Let's go to the bench and I will demonstrate this effect for you with a multimeter. All right, so here's a super simple experiment that you can even try at home and all you'll need is a multimeter, preferably a reasonable quality one, and a magnet. And what I'm going to do here is I mentioned that when a magnetic, a changing magnetic field intersects a conductor, it creates an electrical voltage or a current if the, if the conductor has a current path. So if you make a loop of wire and you expose it to a varying magnetic field, you will get a voltage and a current induced into that piece of wire. And we can take that voltage and current feed into a receiver and the piece of wire becomes our antenna. But Let's just look at the very basics first. I've got my magnet. I've got some leads here, which will act as a piece of wire. What I'm going to do is just take my red lead from my multimeter here. Just get rid of the black one because I'm not going to use it. What? Don't need to. Oh, yes. Do I? No, I'm going to get rid of the red one. Get rid of the red one. Here we go. Eh. Unplug it. So now I only have one lead plugged into my meter. How's this going to work? Well, I'll show you. I'm going to put into this jack here, which is the milliamps and microamps. It's the most sensitive range on my meter. So now I just have a loop of wire that is going to be connected to the most sensitive range of my meter. I'm going to turn my meter around to microamps. That means it's going to display millionths of an amp. That's a really, really small amount. And uh, typically an, a receiver will be quite sensitive down to one microvolt, which means it'll, it'll be able to pick up one microvolt, one millionth of a volt of signal from the antenna will enable a receiver to do its job. It's all you need in most good receivers. What I'm going to do now, though, is I'm going to move my magnet over this piece of wire. So by moving the magnet, I'm going to be creating a varying magnetic field. 
just the movement of the magnet will cause the strength of the field to vary. So, in theory, we should see something on the meter. Now, at the moment, obviously, it's all zeros because I'm not moving anything. But let's see what happens when I start waving my magnet around. Ooh, look at that. Now, it's going from negative to positive because I'm going backwards and forwards. So I'm going one way gives me positive, the other way gives me negative. So, and just flapping backwards and forwards like this. As you can see, I'm getting up to one microamp, 1.2, 1.6. In fact, what I'll do is I'll, uh, I don't know if this has actually got a, no, this doesn't have a high hold on it, so can't do that. But I'm gonna, I could get probably over two microamps here if I really tried hard waving this magnet around the wire. So there we go. So oh, this is my transmitter, this is my antenna. It's really crude and it's really not very good because it's not tuned and this is a very low frequency. Obviously just a, a three or four hertz as fast as I can move this magnet is the, the frequency that I'm producing. So it's really low. We're talking gigahertz with our radios. So yeah, but you can see the magnet induces a current in the wire and the meter's displaying that current. That is how antennas work. But let's look a bit deeper into how antennas work and what makes a good antenna and a bad antenna. Welcome back to the whiteboard. Now I've changed things a bit here. I've got a transmitter here. This is like an old radio transmitter, big master in the sky. And it also creates lines of flux, but we normally draw those as um, like this. You know, you've all seen the typical sort of radio signal radiating out like that. Now, when that happens, these are, this alternates because the current flowing through the antenna goes one way, then the other way. It's AC. Permanent magnets are like DC. Radio frequency transmissions are like AC. And the frequency at which the current going in and out of the antenna changes from one way to the other is the frequency we're operating at. In the case of the old transistor radios, that was about between 500 kilohertz and one and a half megahertz. So it wasn't very fast by modern standards. In the case of our RC systems, it's 2.4 gigahertz. That's 2.4 billion times a second the current changes direction going into your antenna, in and out, in and out, in and out. So that means, obviously, this is a very high frequency. And the, and the higher the frequency, the closer the waves are spaced together. Why is that? Why is that, you ask? Because the speed of light is a constant. Now, if you imagine that we have, I didn't really plan to do this, but let's do it anyway. Here is a distance. And let's say this is how far light travels in one second, which is actually around about 300 million meters, I think, 300 thousand kilometers a second light travels. So this is how far that travels. Now, if you had a frequency of one hertz, then the wave would look like this. It would just be one single cycle of the current along that whole distance. So the, the wavelength of a one hertz signal is 300 million meters, 300,000 kilometers, really long wavelength. But let's imagine, let's say for example, we had, um, let's multiply that make it a gigahertz, make it so that this is going to be, that's one hertz, let's do one hertz, one hertz. Okay, I'll use a different color pen if I can find one that's working today, brown, everyone loves brown. So let's say we do one, no, let's actually make, I'll make it a bit simpler, let's do 10 hertz so that we can, oh, look at that poo color, won't wipe off properly. Let's say we do 10 hertz. Okay, 10 hertz, 10 times faster. So now we'll have actually 10 cycles in the same distance like this, right? So if we would, I'll do that in solid because it's actually hard to see when I do the dotted lines, isn't it? So I haven't done 10, but imagine that's 10, come on. Um, now you can see that the, the waves have been squished because speed of light means that it's always gonna travel that distance. And the more often it changes in one second, then the closer these waves are gonna be. So at 10 hertz, instead of having a wavelength of, gets the other pen. So one hertz, let's do it here, one hertz, hertz equals, 300,000 kilometers per second. So that's not a wavelength, is it? That's wavelength would be 300,000 kilometers, sorry. <laughs> Just, okay, because the one second is implied. What 300,000 kilometers, that's the wavelength of one hertz. 10 hertz has a wavelength of 330,000 kilometers. And as we go up and up and up, if we were to make this like um, 10,000 hertz, then it is, um, we divide that by a thousand, so it's going to be 30 kilometers, and so on, and so on, until we get up into the radio frequencies we're used of, 2.4 gigahertz, where the, the length is around about 100 millimeters, I think, something like that, I can't remember, I'll work it out. So the higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength, and that's important with antennas, because we can just use any length of wire, it will pick up a current, it will pick up a signal, but 
it's, think of the antenna as a bit of a flywheel. If we tune the antenna, if we tune it, then it'll tend to want to resonate at the frequency of the incoming wave, so we won't need as much energy to excite it and make it produce voltage. I'll show you what I mean. Jump cut. Now this is a pendulum. You know, you let them go and they go, ooh, 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 like that pendulum. It has a natural resonant frequency. If you, if you set up a pendulum, it will tend to just travel at the same frequency. It doesn't matter how high it goes, um, how much you put into it, it'll go at the same frequency. That's why those old, remember the old grandfather clocks had the thing that went backwards and forwards the pendulum? That's what gave them their accuracy because the natural resonant frequency of that movement was always the same regardless of the amount of swing and you know so it was it was a constant so here we have a pendulum now you know with a pendulum you can make it rock like a child's swing is a good example if you get a child on a swing and you push at the right time or if you're on the swing and you whoosh at the right time you can get a lot of movement up with a little bit of energy but if you push at the wrong time then it can oppose the swing and it can actually stop so if you push when the swing is way back here or the pendulum is way back there it'll go right up there come back and if you push again you can all the pushing adds together until it creates a lot of swing if you were to push as it was coming back this way you could push that way it would slow down or would actually oppose the build up so if you provide your input energy in sync with the resonant frequency of the pendulum you can get a lot of movement a lot of action for a very little amount of work that's how it works with antennas too I'll go to the antenna model. Da, 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 da. Here we go. Let's draw an antenna. Here is an antenna. Right, that's an antenna. <laughs> Simple, isn't it? That's all the simplest antenna, just the length of wire. Um, now, and usually that then goes into, um, we actually usually use a dipole like this. So we have two pieces of wire and they go off like that. And we used to be you'd use what was called a balanced feeder because if you can imagine this, let's draw a radio wave with the green pen. Here comes a radio wave. Um, let me see, it's going to be a half, oh, radio wave intersects there like that. Okay, when this radio wave intersects there, we're going to have a positive, let's say we have a positive being appeared here, you'll actually get a negative down there. And when the next phase of the wave comes through, so you're going to get a, like this, you're going to have a positive induced here and a negative induced there. So it's going to go backwards and forwards, you get AC, it's going to be flip-flopping backwards and forwards, and the rate at which it flip-flops is the frequency of the radio waves. So what happens there is um, the electrons are going to be running up and down this piece of wire, bing, 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 like that. And if you can make your wire the right length, then it'll be like the pendulum. As the electricity or the, the, you know, the voltage or current is induced in that direction, if the incoming wave adds to that direction, you'll get a stronger signal. If, however, you're trying to use a frequency that doesn't coincide with the resonance of this antenna, you'll still get something, but it will be nothing like the amount of power you get from a properly tuned antenna. That's why we have antennas of a specific length. Make it too long, then it tends to pick up lower frequencies better. It has a lower resonant frequency. If you make it too short, it'll have a higher resonant frequency. So it still won't ring. It won't be the nice position of having the incoming signal adding to the existing amount of energy in the system. So that's why we have antennas that are cut to a particular size. That size varies depending on the type of antenna. The most common antenna is what we call a quarter wave monopole. And this is what we use for wavelength. Now we've all seen those because that's what you get on your 2.4 gig receiver. Most receivers just have a piece of wire poking out the end of the cable. It's a screen cable and it's got a bit of wire hanging out the end. So in effect I can draw that and say so here is our, and this goes off to our receiver. That's a typical 2.4 gig receiver antenna. They're not very good. They're okay, but they're not very good. And they're not very good because a quarter wave monopole is, um, generally requires what we call a counterpoise. A counterpoise is some, something to work against because we're only going to get, you know, signal induced in here. There's nothing in there. So there's, there's only half the, you're only going to get half the signal really. Um, but if it's cut to the right length, it'll resonate and you'll get, it'll all work very nicely. You know, it'll work for well enough. It wouldn't use it as a transmitter antenna because it's not good enough for a an transmitter antenna. You'd be wasting power with a receiver you're not getting much power anyway. As I say, microvolts, just microvolts there. So that's your standard quarter wave monopole. Now you can make that better. You can. And as you'll see, a lot of antennas, they make what they call a sleeved dipole. Dipole means two. Di means two. So you have two poles. This is a monopole. And if you then put, you can do it a number of ways, but the way most commonly done is that you have a little sleeve goes around the outside. You send a bit of tube goes around the outside and connects to the outside of your cable. So now you have a sleeved that's a sleeve dipole. I'm writing that as quickly as I can. Sleeved dipole. They're very, very common in RC. 
almost all transmitter, radio control transmitter antennas are sleeve dipoles. And a lot of receivers, like on the, um, a lot of the Flysky stuff has sleeve dipoles. The high tech stuff, they had sleeve dipoles on some of their receivers. Uh, it just gives you more sensitivity and a better, I'll talk about radiation patterns later, but it's a better antenna. But it, obviously it's heavier, it's bulkier, it's more expensive. So when a quarter wave monopole will do, we use it. Simple as that. Let's talk about some other antennas. Right, so here we've got the two antennas I've already talked about, the, the quarter wave monopole and the quarter wave sleeve dipole. And this is a dipole because it's got one bit up there and one bit down there. Die two. There you go. Right, so what happens though, these are fine, but they don't give us, sometimes we want more range. We want our receiver to pick up more signal. We want our transmitter to broadcast more directionally. How do we get around that? Well, one of the things with antennas, it's the more skin you've got in the game, then the more signal you're going to get. That's basically the more of the conductor that is going to intersect with the magnetic field that's a radio wave, the more of that there is, then the more energy will be absorbed from those radio waves. But we have the problem. We can't just make this wire longer so it captures more of the signal because then the resonant frequency would be wrong. It'd be too low and, and would get, it would actually not give us any more signal. So you, we have to have, find a way to get more skin in the game without changing the resonant frequency. And the usual way to do that is to have multiple um, antennas, multiple little resonant pieces of material because each one will resonate and if you couple them correctly they will all add together to produce a stronger signal. So instead of having one long wire you can have multiple short wires. And that's for example the Yagi antenna. This is named after the Japanese chappie who invented it. And if you look at a Yagi, remember the old TV, the old, I guess some people still use them, the old terrestrial TV systems that had Yagis. That was, there's a, a loop here, this is a, what we call a, um, a loop dipole and then they have a reflector at the back and then they have these little things up here and the more of those you've got the better the ant well, the, the more gain the antenna has and how does that work well if you look at it you've got more skin in the game you've got more metal collecting the energy from the radio wave so if you space these correctly and they're the right length they will add to the energy that the final piece here or this piece here receives and what gets past that will be reflected off the back one back into it so it all adds together so um, this is how we get more gain. We pick up, we just capture more of the signal that's out there by getting more metal in the game. And the downside of that is, of course, we end up with a directional antenna. And I've done a video on directional antennas and radiation patterns, which I will link into the description of this one because it's quite important that you understand that concept. But these antennas are probably the most likely ones you'll encounter. Um, but the Yagi, you don't see many Yagis. I know Team Black Sheep really, really used a lot of Yagis a while ago. I don't know if they still do because Yagis are, can be quite small and they can have a lot of gain. I've got, I don't know where it is, but I've got a 20 decibel Yagi antenna here on 2.4 and it's about that long. It's not that long, it's pretty short. So it's in 20 decibels, that's 100 times more signal than that will pick up. 100 times more signal. So it's like having your transmitter broadcasting 100 times the power. Woohoo! But it's, so it'll give you, you know, what is that? Uh, probably 10 times, no, uh, 1.4, 100, um, I don't know. It, it won't give you 100 times the range, probably 14 times the range or something like that. I forget what the numbers are, but yeah, well, maybe 10 times the range. Maybe 10 times, who knows? Well, I can't be bothered working out, but it'll give you a lot more range, but not as much as 100. So that's the Yagi antenna, but these are linearly polarized antennas. What does that mean? Well, notice it's all straight lights, straight wires, right? So polarization, I think I've done a video as well. I'm not sure, but I'll just, I'll gloss over it now, just in case I haven't. All right, let's talk polarization. Here is a typical one of these sleeve dipoles that you find on your transmitter, your FPV transmitter or your FPV receiver sometimes, or on your 2.4 gig system. That's, uh, you know, this typical rubber ducky thing. We've all, we've all got thousands of these things because you, you get them and you don't use them on the FPV equipment. But um, normally, there we go, we've got two antennas, right? So this signal from this one travels through the ether, hits that one. Simple. Isn't that easy? It couldn't be simpler, so could it? And if we, if we look at that and we turn around, you can see that these antennas, when they're lined up, they overlap a lot. You can see that, you know, there's obviously you can line them up so they completely overlap. So there's a good, the, the signal that leaves this one hits that one and induces quite a bit of signal. So you, you get a good coupling between these antennas. That's great. But what happens if you do this? Well, now you look, look at the area of intersection there between the vertical and the horizontal antenna. It's really, really small. I'll draw it on the board here. Um, so let's say we've got one like this and we've got one like that, right? So the actual, let's say we've got another one over here like this. Now if we look at that, this area here maps directly onto that area. So we get maximum transfer of signal. The signal will transfer through because the wave will leave there and hit that and yes, great. However, with this setup, there's only a minimum amount of intersection. 
um, this area here is the only bit that they share in terms of their alignment. You know, if we do this, and remember, this is just the outside. Inside, it's much, much thinner. So uh, when we do that, we lose 20 decibels of signal. That is to say, all this area here and here and here and here is wasted. We end up with, with basically a hundredth of the signal that we would otherwise get. So if you have your two antennas lined up like that and you get a, um, a signal of, say, X, if you do that, you get one hundredth of X. You lose all the signal because this just can't pick up a signal that's in the wrong plane. And that's the problem with linear polarization. It's, it's, a, it's you know, very, very um, angle dependent. And that means if you're flying, a, you've got your antenna here on your FPV goggles perhaps, and you're flying away in a plane, you do a bank, whoa, where's your video gone? Because suddenly one hundredth the signal. It's like being much, much further away. Not a good look. That's why we came up with circularly polarized antennas. Well, that's why one of the applications of circularly polarized antennas, they allow us to um, produce a wave, which actually, if we look at the normal transmission from a linear antenna, I will draw this for you. Here we go. Here is our linear antenna from our, let's say it's from our radio control transmitter. Right, and here is a linear, here's a linear antenna on our receiver. Then it goes like this. It goes ooh, like that. There you go. Easy peasy, isn't it? It doesn't go this way. If we would look down on this, let's do a planned view of this. Let's take a look. Say we're looking down from the top, and there's a stick and a transmitter. And here's our receiver with its antenna. Okay. It's going this way. It's not going sideways. So there's no this way. It would look like this. It would be because we're only looking down on this waveform. There's no horizontal component to this transmission. So what happens then is, what if our airplane banks and our receiver is looking like this? So suddenly our airplane's banked over, so again, now we have our, because we've got the transmitter portion like that, receiver portion like that. Well, suddenly, this isn't really seeing anything, because you can't see a wave there, can you? Because you're looking down on it. It's the wrong polarization, so we get very little signal. This explains why most receivers have two antennas. Why? Because what you can do is, obviously, you have one that's going straight up and another one that comes out at 90 degrees so if we look at it this way there's the one that goes straight up there's the one that goes out at 90 degrees so even if we bank over one of the antennas is going to be receiving the, the right thing so let's do it i'll try and do it with a do it with my felt pens do some juggling here here we go here is our two antennas at 90 degrees here we go here is our transmitter antenna as our plane banks and this antenna starts to pick up less and less signal this one picks up more and more you can see because it's lining up so that's why we have two antennas, and that's why they're always, we should always mount them at 90 degrees, so that you've always got one in the game, even if you're completely 90 degree banked. That's why you do it. So, but this is a really cumbersome way to do it, because linear polarization, meh, why don't we just come up with a signal that exists in both the horizontal and the vertical? Wouldn't that be easier? Oh yes, well it's not easier, but that's the best way to do it in many cases. And we do that, and you'll all start recognizing what I'm gonna put on the board now. Dun, 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 dun. And that's done most often by way of a, certainly on our FPV gear, a skew planar wheel. Which is, you know what they look like, I'm, my drawing is crap, I'm sorry. But it's a skew planar wheel. And if we look at the, uh, the way this transmits, instead of having a signal like this, it actually sends a corkscrew, a circularly polarised signal. And that exists both in the horizontal and vertical and every other plane. So when you have another antenna over here, can we see that on the board? We can, that's great. When we have another one of these skew planar wheels over here, it doesn't matter what the relationship is between those two antennas, because this is spiralling, it's always going to be picking up um, the signal, unless it's spiralling the wrong way. Because we still have polarisation. Even though we have horizontal and verticals, we have a left hand, or it's like a screw thread. It can be left hand thread or right hand thread. As long as this is left hand and that's left hand, or this is right hand and that's right hand, they'll work fine at any angles. But if you make the wrong thread, then you get nothing. It's like having these crossed. Because if your thread is incompatible, then you, once again, you're only getting a small amount of contact because instead of the, the, um, the receive, you know, this antenna meshing with this, the receiver is actually trying to do this. Go the other way. And so you get very little contact between the antenna and the incoming radio signal. So you get very little signal and you get crappy reception. And that's, um, that's why you want to make sure you have the same polarization on each end. But those are the ro uh, 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 circularly polarized antennas, but what do you want? What do you do if you want gain from a circularly polarized antenna? Because obviously, hmm, how do you make that well, produce an antenna that has gain, not with a linear antenna, but a circular one? You can't use a Yagi because Yagi's only got the sticks. It won't pick up 
very well a circularly polarized signal. It will pick it up, but not as well as a properly designed circularly polarized antenna with gain. So let's go and have a look at what that might look like. And again, you've all seen these because many of you will have used them. We have a reflector and we have a coil of wire. And it's pretty easy to see how that puts more metal in the game. What happens here is as the wave comes along and it hits there, that's fine, and it goes up and the next one hits there and there. And because of the length of this wire, and um, the length of the radio wave, each wave adds, as it goes through this coil, adds to the strength of the signal. So you get a compounding effect, like pushing that pendulum at just the right time. So we get more and more and more gain, and out you go. So the longer the antenna, the more turns on it, then the more gain you get. And you might think, well, what about resonance? Well, hey, you've got resonance. You've got like a little loop every way. As long as that loop, the loop from say, this point here to the matching point on the next turn is right, as long as that distance there is correct, then you'll get resonance. Woohoo! So that's why the spacing of the turns is very important. And also the diameter, because there's other factors involved as well. But basically that's how it works. That's how your, your um, what is it? Um, oh man, I hate it when my brain fails. It's getting old, it's terrible. <laughs> that's how your uh, high gain antenna works with a circular polarization. But of course there is one more type of antenna. It's not really an antenna. It's an extension to an antenna that can be used with circular or horizontal polarization. But we very rarely use them. Although if you want to go a long, 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 long way, then this is what you want. And it is an antenna. It, it doesn't matter what sort of antenna. It can be a sleeve dipole. It can be a balanced dipole. It can be a skew planar antenna. It can be anything you like. But you want to have an antenna. I'm just going to draw a circle because it can be any kind of antenna, right? There. And that goes off to your receiver down there, right? And what you do is really quite simple. Is you put a great big honking dish on here, like that, so that you're capturing all this area here of incoming signal, woo, -woo and you're reflecting it onto that antenna. It comes in and it bounces onto the, like, like a, um, well, like a solar concentrator or anything like that, like a headlight beam. What it's doing is it's collecting all that radio frequency energy and directing it directly onto that antenna. And the great thing about dishes is, the size of the dish doesn't matter. It's the antenna that's important. So you can use one dish for many, many different frequencies as long as you have different antennas at the focal point. And we've seen the satellite dish, obvious example, satellite dish. Satellites don't broadcast a whole lot of power. So if you're watching satellite television, you're way down here on the Earth, 20,000 miles or so up in space, there's a satellite. And it doesn't broadcast a lot of power. But this, because we get so much gain from these parabolic dish antennas, we can pull that tiny little signal out of the ether and use it to run it or use it to deliver a signal to our television. It's fantastic because these can have, depending on the size, massive gains. You see the big um, radio telescopes, you know, the dishes that point out into space for detecting pulsars and quasars and things. They have, a fan well, obviously they have got to have a fantastic amount of gain because some of those signals have traveled thousands or millions or even billions of light years to get to that antenna. So you've got to collect an awful lot of them before you can even detect them. So you have a massive great dish. Now obviously dishes for us, you know, on the, in the hobby, pretty impractical. You're not going to have a dish on your transmitter or a dish on your model. Nah, it's not going to work because they're very directional. It's like a spotlight beam, you know. If you get just a little bit off, you know, it's gone. You know, because the signal will no longer be captured, it'll be pointed out somewhere else. So you've got to have very directional, good tracking with a, a dish if you intend to use a dish. So we don't usually use them, but as I say, if you wanted to do very long range FPV, this is what you would use because you could build yourself a nice big dish and put your antenna in the middle and you could get, you know, 30 decibels of gain. That's a thousand times more signal than just the antenna on its own. Woohoo! That's that'll take you a long way, even on a few hundred milliwatts. So that's it. But that, this is antenna theory. I hope I've explained a little bit about antenna theory. As I say, um, key factors are you've got to have all, a lot of metal in the game, a lot of conductor in the game if you want to get a lot of signal. But I have spoken about radiation patterns because, as I mentioned here, this is very directional, and you, there's no free lunches in the antenna business. Um, if you want a lot of gain you have to sacrifice something. And what you usually sacrifice is directionality now, or, or om, omnidirectionality. Let me just draw a picture for you. As I say, there is a video you should watch, which I've linked in the description of this. But if you're too lazy, I will give you a brief. Um, oh, this whiteboard is awful. Oh, man, it's lost its whiteboard ability. Hope you can see this. But um, if we have our little, here's our little um, sleeve dipole that we've talked about before. Goes off and here's our transmitter. Let's see if we put a transmitter on it. Typical radio control transmitter. If we were to look at what happens, you know, if we had a little meter and we could measure the strength of the radio signal coming out of this, it would look something like this. Um, 
It's kind of like a big donut. Imagine we've cross-sectioned a donut. There's a big circle out there and a circle out there. There's a hole through the middle. That's as close as we usually get to omnidirectional or direct, isodirectional, which is directing the same strength in all directions. It's as close as we can get in the real world. Um, and what happens is when you get a high gain, take the Tyrannus for example. A lot of people have taken the three decibel or the 2.2 decibel antenna, the little one like that, and replaced it with a five decibel antenna. Well, how do they get the extra decibels? What does it mean? What it means is that this antenna is usually slightly differently designed and it produces, sometimes they have a little coil in here and all sorts of clever little things because you can actually use a longer antenna and put a little coil to make it look shorter or a little, use loading to make it look shorter and things like that. It's way over, you know, beyond this video to explain all that. But um, what they do is they effectively change the shape of this, what we call the radiation pattern. And instead of doing like that, the radiation pattern looks a bit flatter like this. So it's the same amount of power. Your transmitter is not putting out any more power, but it's, it's sending it in a different direction somewhat. So if you're looking at ultimate range with the two decibel antenna, this is the maximum range you can get, right? With the five decibel antenna, you can get that range because your signal is pushed out the sides more. The, the bad thing is, as I say, no free lunches. If, you're not, if you have your antenna pointed in the wrong direction, then, for example, say if you're flying out here, if your plane's up here, like so, geez, that's a nice plane. If your plane's up there like that, then if you're using the regular antenna, um, then it'll give you, well, actually, let's say it's down here. There's your plane, right? With the regular antenna, even though it's only two decibels, you're going to have control. But if you're using the five decibel antenna and, your ant and, and the plane's in the wrong place, well, actually, you're not going to have control because your signal will only go out that far. You get more range with the low gain antenna than the high gain antenna if you're in the, you know, uh, higher elevation as it's called. So you, you're not directly out the side. So this hole up the top where there's virtually no signal is much bigger with a high gain antenna for using these sleeve dipoles. So yeah, got to be aware of that. They say no free lunch. There's only the same air amount of power. It's just distributed differently with a high gain antenna. And with a Yagi, I'll just do a quick view of the Yagi to show you how that might work if my board will erase. Oh, this is awful. I don't know how you fix this. Oh, but CRC people have said, use some WD-40, I'll try that. Um, let's draw our Yagi antenna. And these are what's called radiation patterns, and they're all done in a lab with in an anechoic chamber and all sorts of clever stuff, right? So there's Yagi antenna goes off to our transmitter, if we were going to do that. And in the old days, um, people did use Yagi's. I think Maynard Hill, Maynard Hill, this is going back a long time ago, when you, probably before most of you were born, Maynard Hill flew to 27,000 feet, I think, with a model aircraft. And to, because we only had the old long wire and, and so forth, he used a Yagi antenna on his transmitter to get that sort of range because it wouldn't give it normally. So he used a Yagi antenna. It was a great big thing because 27 megahertz is like really big antennas because the wavelength is so long and the frequency is low. Right, so if we were to draw that radiation pattern with a Yagi, it's going to look something like this. And there'll also be some little bits out here. You get what we call side lobes. Don't have to worry too much about those. But you can see that if you are pointing your antenna at the model, you can go a long, long way. Look at it. You can go that far. However, if you're flying out the side, you might only be able to go this far. So you've sacrificed that range for this range. You just squeeze that balloon differently. And in fact, in the video I'll link to, I use a balloon. Oh no, I use the balloon to demonstrate the fact that it's just like taking a balloon and squeezing it into a long sausage shape or having it nice and round, depending on which one it is. There you go, that's enough for antenna theory. I'm bored now. I'm sure most of you have gone to sleep long ago and uh, have got better things to do with your lives than watch me talk at a whiteboard. But that's it, that's antenna theory. So in respect to the long range systems, you can see how important antennas are because you know it's just the little changes, if it's not resonant, then you'll get very poor efficiency. And if it's a directional antenna that's pointing in the wrong direction, you're gonna get very poor results. And if it doesn't have enough skin in the game, then you're also gonna get poor results. Because you know, as I say on the free sky, R9 or whatever it is, that long range system. The receiver antenna, it's long enough, but they've bent it round. And the bending round at the end bit um, basically means that the bit of signal that's picked up on one side is going to counter the bit on the other side. It'll still be resonant, so that's good, but it won't be the most optimal antenna in terms of its sensitivity. Okay? But what we might do is just, once I've tested the Free Sky system, I will make my own antennas up and we'll try them out and we'll see how they go. Because, hey, you know, it's, it's always good to experiment and learn about stuff. And so I'm sure that we can make some pretty good um, sleeve dipoles or whatever, because that's what the Crossfire uses, some sleeve dipoles. Uh, and they'll give much better results than that little flimsy sort of film antenna with the thing on it, whatever. And we can also look at transmitter antennas and make up perhaps a, 
a sleeve dipole for the transmitter. They're, they're sending it, apparently they are sending a new, a new antenna, woohoo, lucky, lucky. So when that arrives, we'll use that and see how it goes. I'm not gonna test it with the other antenna because obviously that would just potentially damage the module. Anyway, questions, comments in the usual place. And I thank you for watching. And now I've got so much more to do and it's so hot. See, I took my jersey off because it's getting warm. Spring's on the way in the Southern Hemisphere. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.